right, can you believe that we are at our last message in the series, Hope Beyond All Circumstances, out of the book of Philippians? We're so excited to uh, bring this series to you, and we're excited about the fact that we are one church on two campuses, and uh, we have a campus in West Seattle, and we want to welcome through our broadcast technology, we want to welcome, can we just get a big shout out to our West Seattle campus today? So glad that you're with us. I was there last week, and uh, what a great, growing, vibrant group of people we have in West Seattle as part of our church family, and we're so glad that you're with us today. I'm going to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to pick it up in verse 14 and read through verse 20 as we close out this series. And uh, let's start with verse 14. It reads, yet it was good of you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid again and again when I was in need. Not that I am looking for a gift, but I am looking for what may be credited to your accounts. I have received full payment and even more. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, we've come to the end of the, the letter here. This is a love letter, really, a real personal friendship letter between Paul and the church in Philippi. And uh, I want to ask you today a question. And I want you to just really think about this question. When you come to church, what are you most excited about when you come to church? Now, I'm going to give you a pass here, you know, that it's probably a little bit more noble than you want people to see your new outfits or, uh, you know, you, want to, you can't wait to get a coffee at the cafe or, you know, it might be on any number of things. Uh, maybe it's because you just can't wait to get an hour and a half reprieve from your kids, okay? Those, those may be, uh, but let's go a little more noble. Maybe today you, you're most excited about coming in here and the preaching, uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're excited about the, the music and the worship, that you look forward to that the most when you come to church at East Ridge, that it just inspires you and lifts you up. Others of you, you might say, boy, I can't, I love it because I get to connect with my friends and fellowship and people that mean a lot to me. I get to, get to have that relationship time with them. Others of you say, I, I, I look forward to a time where I can just come and share my prayer requests and be prayed for. There's many good, good reasons for coming to church. But I want to propose to you today that if we really knew the promises of God in Scripture and we really believe the promises of God in Scripture and how much blessing is attached to a certain thing that we do every week, that we would actually say that the thing that we look forward to the most when we come to church every week is the offering. I got three amens. Uh, <laughs> tells me I got a lot of preaching to do here today. But, you know, it's true, though. The, the, the way I see Scripture and the way the promises are, are attached to giving and generosity is that the, the most direct pipeline for God's blessings to flow into our lives, for breakthrough and anointing, is in this area of generosity and giving. In fact, Jesus made two statements in the New Testament, uh, more than two statements, but these two statements that I want to give you today should just charge us up to want to be abundant, generous, sacrificial givers to the work of the Lord, to the kingdom of God. He said, remember, it's Jesus' words, happens to be the Son of God, not just, you know, Washington Post or New York Times. This is Jesus talking here, okay? Give, in Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, some of you heard that verse multiple times, but think about what Jesus is saying here. He's saying that if you become generous and you give, you can't stop God from giving back to you. Now, that shouldn't be our motivation, but we should know that God can't be outgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. And when God gives, he doesn't give in small amounts. He gives a good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, overflowing with generosity towards us. And it'll be poured into your lap for the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Incredible words from Jesus. 
Listen to this next statement that he made, and it's, it's recorded in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. It says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Wow, what an amazing principle here is that what, when we give and what we give away brings greater blessing to us than what we receive. And it's a powerful concept. Um, but I'll tell you what, I could just sense right now that uh, maybe you are not so excited about this topic on a Sunday morning. Maybe you're not, oh, I came to church, or I brought a friend, and they're going to talk about giving and money. Let me just be real honest with you. I avoided for many years early on in ministry, uh, I've been in ministry for 33 years now, I avoided early on speaking about this topic for that very reason. I knew there were people who say, you know, the only thing the church wants is your money. All they talk about is money, 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 money. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, but some of you have thought that or heard it at least. But I've changed my tune. And the reason I've changed my tune and the reason I speak about it more often is not just because Pastor Steve's out of town on vacation and he assigned it to me. <laughs> hey, last one was on pro-life, so, you know, we're, we're just tackling the easy topics here. But I've learned over the years that as I've prayed with people, as I've counseled people, as I've talked with people, some of the things that are the biggest worries, the biggest stress, the biggest challenges that people face have to do with money and their thinking towards it. And as a called shepherd of a flock, a, a pastor who is to guide the sheep lovingly and caring, carefully, it would be irresponsible of me or any other pastor to avoid that subject because it is such a big, heavy, pressing thing on people's hearts and minds. Secondly, we should talk about money and we should talk about giving because the Bible talks a lot about it. If we're going to preach the Bible, we need to talk about it. And, the, and you know the Gospel of Luke alone? Scholars say that about 25% of the Gospel of Luke talks about finances, money, giving, generosity. Amazing. So we would be cutting out a big section of Scripture if we didn't talk about this subject. And third, I would say this, that I have learned over the years, not only personally, but in the lives of people who have caught on to the concept of overflowing generosity, that there is incredible promise and blessing that comes. Some of the most joyful, happy, awesome people are people who have caught on to the principles in God's Scripture about giving. And why wouldn't we talk about something that would bring that kind of joy into our lives? Amen? Okay, I'm up to 10. We're going good. I want to look at three things today because the Philippian church is an example of what it means not just to give, but to overflow with generosity. That word's used throughout not only in this passage, but another one we're going to look at. I want to look at three things. If you're taking notes, we're going to look at the model of overflowing generosity. We're going to look at the motivation for overflowing generosity. And we're going to look at the measure of overflowing generosity. All right, let's, let's dive right in. Number one, the model of overflowing generosity. Well, the model for Paul was this Philippian church. He gives them accolades in this passage of Scripture because they partnered with Paul in his needs and in his ministry. When Paul planted that church, he wasn't there very long. He moved on to plant other churches, but this Philippian church gave again and again whenever Paul had a need. I must remind you that this Philippian church was from a very poor region. They were oppressed, they were persecuted, and yet they gave again and again, Paul says. And then he writes another letter to a church in another region called Corinth, and when he writes this letter, he uses a group of churches called the Macedonian churches, which comprised of Thessalonica, Berea, and Philippi, the Philippians. He used this Philippian church as an example to spur on another church to be generous, and, and tap into this thing called overflowing generosity. So I want us to go to that passage of Scripture, if you'll turn with me, to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and let's look at the model that Paul points out of the Philippian church as part of the Macedonian churches. Verse 1, and now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, Philippi was one of them, out of the most severe trial their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. 
For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. So we urged Titus, since he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But just as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in your love for us, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. Paul mentions several things in this passage. I want to look at some of the very specific qualities of this model of generosity, this church. What made them an example that Paul pointed, out, pointed people to? The first one is this. They gave in spite of their difficult circumstances. They gave in spite of their difficult circumstances. Did you notice there in verse 2? It says, out of their most severe trial. That, that, those words there speak of being put into the fire and tested. They were persecuted. This, this group of believers had gone through severe trial. Notice a little bit later it says their extreme poverty. They were very impoverished financially. They didn't have a lot of financial material resources. And you know, part of us wants to say, come on, Paul, give them a pass. They're going through a tough time. They're going through the fire. They don't have a lot of money. Don't talk about generosity to people that are in bad circumstances. Or maybe we've said ourselves, you know what, once I get to a little bit more income, once I get out of the woods here, once I get out of this season of my life, then I'll start being generous. Then I'll start giving to the work of the Lord. That's not what these Christians did. As a model of overflowing generosity, they didn't have a poor me attitude just because they were going through a, a tough time or because they were going through extreme, extreme poverty. No, it says they overflowed with joy and their, their generosity was rich. It welled up. It overflowed. Incredible. How many of you say, that's unusual? Most people say, ah, you know, I can't give because of my circumstances. This church gave out of severe trial and extreme poverty. But notice, secondly, they gave joyfully. It says they overflowed with joy. Their overflowing joy welled up in rich generosity. It, it wasn't that they were just, you know, that they, that they were talked into giving or they were, um, you know, their arms were twisted to give or they were even just willing to give. They had joy in the aspect of giving to the work of the Lord no matter what they were facing. Incredible. You know, 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says this, as Paul talks about their giving. He said, each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, here in this room in Issaquah and over in West Seattle, I want a show of hands. How many of you heard the phrase at offering time, God loves a cheerful giver? Raise your hand. All right, almost 100%. Some of you think that's the favorite verse of pastors, is God loves a cheerful giver. It reminds me of the story of a, of a mother who uh, wanted to teach generosity and giving to her daughter. And so on the way to church that day, the mother gave her daughter a dollar bill and a quarter. And she said, you know, it's really up to you what you decide to give. You can give the dollar, you can give the quarter, or you can give them both in the offering today. It really is your decision. So they go to church, they sit together, the offering takes place. The mother didn't notice what had happened, but so on the way home, she asked her daughter, what did you give? Did you give the quarter? Did you give the dollar? Did you give them both? What did you give in the offering today? And she said, well, you know what? I was going to give the dollar. But then the pastor got up and said, God loves a cheerful giver, and I felt I'd be more cheerful if I gave the quarter. <laughs> I don't know that's what Paul was talking about here. Maybe he was. But really, our attitude, no matter what the amount is, we should be joyful in giving. And this church was joyful. They looked forward to it. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that Paul urged them, the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. If we're going to talk about hope beyond all circumstances, if we're going to have joy in all circumstances, then even when you're going through a tough time, but there's an opportunity to give to the work of the Lord, joy is deeper than your circumstances. Hope is greater than your circumstances. Why? Because your hope and your joy is in Jesus. 
That's the principle that Paul's trying to teach us. But notice they also gave, not only joyfully, they gave sacrificially. In verse 3 of 2 Corinthians 8, it says, For I testify that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I thought, how, I know how, how to give as much as I'm able, but how do I give beyond what I'm able? What does that mean? I, I thought about it, and I thought, you know what? There are times, and maybe you've had this experience, or maybe I'm the only sinner in the group, but there's times where an appeal will be given. And I'll think, and in my mind, I'm going, okay, we've got this responsibility, this responsibility, I've got this much in savings, this much in retirement, this much, and I'm, I'm just, I'm doing the old accounting thing as best as I can, and think, okay, I can afford to give this amount, and it not really mess up anything else. You know what, that's giving to my ability. But this church didn't ask the question, what can I give and it not hurt? What can I give and it not mess up my life? They were willing to give not only what they were able, but they were willing to go beyond what they were able. Incredible. They overflowed with generosity. I think they believed the promise in Philippians 4.19. They believed that their God would supply all their need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. Even if it means giving away something I need for the work of the Lord. I believe that God will supply and resupply that need. Incredible. Incredible trust. That's really what's involved is trust that God is going to be true to his promises if I respond with generosity towards his work. David said it this way in 2 Samuel 24, 24. He says, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. But I want to bring to the Lord something that actually costs me something. As he knows the value of stepping out, stretching, going above and beyond, even in the area of, of giving. That's what Paul says. As you excel in everything else, excel in this grace of giving. Well, a third way they gave is not just joyfully and sacrificially, but they gave eagerly. And you find that at the end of verse 3 and, the, and verse 4. Look what it says. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the saints. They were begging for a chance to give. Isn't that awesome? I mean, when's the last time you came into church and said, okay, can we skip the worship? Let's have offering. They were pleading, begging, can we have the, not obligation, but the privilege to be open-handed towards the things of the Lord. Incredible. They saw it as a privilege. They were begging to give. They were eager to give. And so I asked the obvious question that maybe you're thinking in your mind right now. The question is, what motivated that church to give like that? What, you know, motivation talks about a motor. What drives them to give in that way? Because that is not common. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about the motivation, secondly, of overflowing generosity. And to do that, just go over one chapter in 2 Corinthians to chapter 9. Paul's still building on this thought, using them as a model. And he's talking to the Corinthians here. And in verses 10 and 11, he says, Now he, God, who supplies seed. Who supplies seed? God. He supplies seed to the sower. This is after he says so generously. So he supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. He will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can spend it on your selfish desires what you want all the time. No, that doesn't say that, does it? I, I got off my notes here. You can be, he will bless you in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will overflow and result in thanksgiving to God. What was the motivation of their giving? Well, I want to point out a couple of things. Two motivations, I, I think, here. First of all is a motivation of what I call creation. They understood that God was the creator, that God owns it all. If God made everything, he is the owner of everything, right? And many people say this, well, you know what, when, when they hear, well, you know, uh, give, give God uh, back what he already has given you. They say, you know what, I, I worked hard for the money. I, I went out and I earned that. It's my money. I can do with it whatever I want. Let me ask you a question. Did God charge you for the air to breathe so that you could go out of work? 
Did God charge you for the mind that he gave you and the creativity that he invested in you? He, he gave that freely to you so you could put your mind to work, your strength, your energy, your experience. God gave all of that to you in the first place, didn't he? He's the supplier. He's the one who gives first. Our giving is simply a response to the big giver, God, who's already freely given to us. Amen? And that's the motivation here. For, for instance, if, if you gave your child, if you have a child, you gave your child a candy bar, I, I'm sure they'd be excited about that. They'd have that, that man, if, if it was my son, when he was little, he'd dive right into that candy bar. Well, what if you as a parent, after giving that candy bar to them, as they start to, to, to partake of that candy bar, you say... Hey, son or daughter, can I just have a little piece for myself? Now, some kids would say, no, it's mine. You gave it to me. Other, other kids, you know, like my grandson, he's a perfect child. <laughs> By the way, we're excited today because our grandson, Lucas, seven months old, first grandchild, is on his way today to visit grandma and grandpa at their house for the first time in Washington. We're excited about that. And I know that grandparents never exaggerate about the abilities of their grandkids, but this kid is incredible. He got his driver's permit at four months, and he's driving at seven. He's in the, on the road right now. No, we're excited about that. But if a kid has a give back, so most of them is like, well, you gave it. As a parent, you'd say, well, Come on, I gave you the candy bar in the first place, right? Or what if someone was so generous to you and they bought you a house, if you're here in Issaquah, if you, they bought you a house right on Lake Sammamish, several hundred thousand dollar house, and they bought it free and clear and gave it to you. Or if you're in West Seattle, a house right on the Sound, right overlooking Alki or whatever it might be. It's free and clear, only one condition, that as the giver of that house, they get to stay in the self-contained apartment with a separate entrance, its own kitchen, its own bathroom. They get to stay there. You'd say, deal. But sometimes when God even asks for a little bit back, we say, no way. When he's given us everything to begin with, are you following the logic here? God supplies seed to sow. He makes us rich on every occasion so that we can be generous, just like he is. So the motivation of creation. Secondly, the motivation of redemption. And I think this is even a bigger compelling motivation for giving. It goes all the way back to chapter 8, verse 1, that we started with today. And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace. Everybody say grace. The grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. You see, their overflowing generosity was a response to the grace that they'd already received by becoming saved. From going from death to life. From going from eternal death to eternal life. God, out of no reason that we have earned it at all, he graciously gave us salvation through his son Jesus. We didn't do anything to earn it. He gave it fully and completely to us out of his grace. You know, one of the proofs that you've actually experienced, not just thought about the grace of God, not just studied the grace of God, but you have felt and you've experienced and you know the grace of God personally, one of the proofs that you've actually experienced that is that you are radically, overwhelmingly generous. And see, if on the other hand, you need to be commanded to give, it may be a clue that you really haven't tapped into what it means that God has given you such grace. He's given you everything. If you were facing death today, the material things that we hold on to so tightly wouldn't mean all that much, would they? It would be the eternal life that we're facing. On the other side of death, it would mean the world to us. God freely gave that to us. If we have a compelling desire to give generously, it's a clear sign that we've drank deeply from the grace of God. You see, to be over, overflowing with our generosity, we need to be more overwhelmed by the grace that God has given to us. It's a difference between a love relationship that we're supposed to have with Jesus, a love relationship that says, wow, you've given me everything, so that is based on grace, 
and a, and a legal relationship with Jesus. Many of us slide into that. A legal relationship with Jesus in which we say, you know what? I need to keep these moralistic commands to give. One says, Jesus, I owe you everything because of what you've done for me. The other says, you know what, God? You owe me because I've been a good person and I've done all these right things and you're lucky to have me on your team. You owe me something, God. A vast difference. Well, let's talk about finally the measure. Not just the model and motivation. What's the measure? Because some of you are bottom line people here today. You say, okay, Pastor Larry, I got it. We're supposed to be generous. We're supposed to be overflowing generous. What's the bottom line? What? Give me the dollar amount. Give me the real measure. What is overflowing generosity? You know what's great about the Bible? It never gives you a dollar amount. It never does. But it talks about measure. It talks about the measure you use. What is that measure? What's the measure for you? What's the measure? Here's the deal. I look at it this way. To have overflowing generosity, we need to have the mindset of the message that my dad pounded into me. I hear, I hear this, even though it, two years ago he went to be with Jesus, I still hear his voice at certain times in my life, and his voice would say, son, don't make the minimum your maximum. Don't just get by. Don't make the minimum your maximum. Show up to work 15 minutes early. Put in a little extra effort. Don't just look at the syllabus and say, what do I need to do to get to pass this class? Look at what you need to do for extra credit to go over the top. Don't make the minimum your maximum. How many of you think that's good advice? That's great advice. I appreciate him for that advice. Until it comes to giving, oh, oh I'd like to make the minimum because I tithe. I give 10%. You know that's the minimum? That's the minimum. For years they've taught me to tithe, and I've tithed for years. Some of us say, oh, whew. Oh, I finally made it to 10%. I've reached the maximum. The Bible never says that. The Bible says that really a starting place is that giving back 10%. The tithe was before the law, during the law, and after the law. But it's really a, a, a minimum. Overflowing generosity is saying, God, you've given me so much. I want to be able to be in a place where I can just even go over and above. I want to overflow. Well, some of you could get to that minimum if you had to right now. You know why I know that? Because some of you, if you haven't been tithing, I would challenge you to say this. If you found out tomorrow morning that you were this next year getting a 10% pay cut, I guarantee you probably wouldn't be too happy. But secondly, what would you do? You'd have to start thinking, how can we make this work? What can I cut out? What can I do? Because I'm going to get 10% less. And if you can make do with a 10% pay cut, why not make do now and say, okay, God, I'm going to make some adjustments. I'm going to do some things so I can get to at least that minimum point to where I'm given to your work. Why? Because the promises are there. You will meet my needs. You will pour out an abundance on my lap. You are a God who looks for me to just start to open my hand towards your things, and you'll fill it again and again and again. Some of you, though, it's true. You've boxed yourself in. You're in so much debt, you can't even see your way out of it. You're yeah, let's get you some good financial counseling. We've got people in the church. We could, we could get you on a plan to start moving in a, in a direction that would help you, but at least you have the heart to and you want to say, okay, God, help me just get a little step closer, a little step closer. Why do I urge you to do this? Because your breakthrough and your blessing is on the other side of you opening up and being more willing and generous towards the things of God. I know what I've seen it time and time again. God's promises are true. So make a plan. You say, well, what do I start with? If I've never given before, what do I start with? Well, look at the model of these Philippians. Start with what scares you. Start with what makes you have to trust God to be able to do it. Then you know you're in the zone of, okay, at this moment, that's overflowing generosity for me. I want to close with this verse in Malachi chapter 3. You've heard this many times. It says, well, a man robbed God, yet you robbed me. But you ask, how do we rob you? In tithes and offerings. Let me just stop right there. I used to think, I'm not robbing God. I, I give tithe. But he says, tithes and offerings. He challenged me one day. It's like, you know what? I'm wanting you to grow in your faith and continue to grow. Add to that. Grow in that. 
He says, you're under a curse, the whole nation of you, because you're robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven. How about this for overflowing generosity? Open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that you will not have enough room for it. Wow. We either believe what God says and we're motivated by his grace towards us, or we don't. And I just want to challenge you today. It's a tough day to talk about this because, I mean, we're right in the middle of between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. (laughs) Consumerism in America. And yet we find ourselves in Philippians at this passage. So, I want to pray to conclude this message. In just a moment, in West Seattle, Pastor Pete's going to come and pray with you and close out the service, and I'll close out the service here. But let's just all pray together right now, shall we? Lord, we just come before you right now. We thank you, first of all, for the amazing grace of eternal life that you have given us. None of us have earned that. You freely gave. In fact, the Word says that He who was rich, that's you, Lord. You had everything in glory, and you gave that up to come here on earth. You became poor so that through your poverty, we might become rich. If we have faith in you, Jesus, we are rich with spiritual blessings that you can't put an amount to. And so we thank you for that, Lord. Help us, Lord, as we move forward in these days ahead to not make the minimum our maximum. Help us to trust you more and more, to believe you more and more, to stretch more and more because the days are short and the harvest is plentiful and the laborers are few. I pray, Lord, that we would be like the Philippian church that joyfully, sacrificially, and eagerly looks for the opportunity to give towards your work and your purposes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.